got a problem here And it's more than just an album stream and Punisher When life begins to suck, who's reporting it? Luckily, you got two friends who you won't forget Coming live, an album and friend on survival Laughing non-stop, case drops on a cycle Louder than intrusive thoughts off an iPhone How do you make the world seem bright with the lights off? AFs, it might as well stay up Lies being told like that dinosaur BS Magnifying glass to the ground if they don't see us Having the time, roasting your favorite pizza Bougie ain't an option, it's the way Take you to the grave, have moving to the place You already know when they take the case Laugh the pain away, it's affirmative murder Hello and welcome to another episode of Affirmative Murder The Equal Opportunity True Crime Comedy Podcast I am Alvin Williams, joined as always by my partner in true crime, France L. Evans Oh yes, why in a minute, Mr. Postman Yeah man, I'm the mailman, can't you tell man Go post it what up, folks? We're trying something new this week. Um, first of all, we're coming to you from the past. I don't know how many episodes it's been since we've since we've recorded, but I'm gonna assume um, at least one because we we've been back from CrimeCon for some time. If you're hearing this, but we are currently still fresh from CrimeCon while speaking. Yeah. So we might speak, you know, about some things that have recently happened. And one thing that recently happened is we go to CrimeCon, we get we speak to all these creators and different people, and they inspire us to up our game, try some different stuff, you know, stop uh, holding ourselves back by overthinking things. And so we are going to attempt to do video this episode. And so if the audio's messed up, it's because we tried to do the video and it didn't work at all and it all fell apart. But if it didn't all fall apart, then you're watching this, maybe exclusively on Patreon. I'm not really sure what we're going to do with it. This might be a throwaway. We might even put this out. We might just see and get two in our heads again and, and, and back off and not do it anymore. But Fran, what's yeah. up, man? Good to see you. Um, Back from Nashville, how did yeah, you enjoy Nashville? We don't need to get into crime con too much if you don't feel like it, but it, how was Nashville, the experience of seeing the city of Nashville? Um, Nashville was, um, it was what I expected as far as like the, um, what I've, other stories I've heard about what Nashville, what, what's the thing to do out there and I, and everything I saw I was like, okay, that, that sounds about accurate as far as just like a lot of cowboy boots, a lot of, a lot of jorts, <laughs> a lot of jean shorts going on. Yes. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, bachelorette parties type of thing. Had some yeah. good food. Food was delicious. Yeah, yeah. Um, we got some. We got some Hattie Bizzles. Yeah, Hattie Hattie Bees. But um, it was fun, man. Good time. We had. We went to like a nice little rooftop spot. Yes, um, it was Blake Shelton's restaurant or Blake bar. Shelton's bar, and uh, we got some drinks oh, really? there. Yeah, just just hanging out, and but the food was delicious, man. But I, I, I had a great time though. It was it was fun. Yeah, the drive wasn't terrible. I want to thank everybody who participated in creating. Objectively, one of the best um, Spotify playlists to ever exist. I, I, I will. Um, I got to give it up to y'all. You know, that was that was your doing. That was your making. As a team, we collaborated on something really special. And um, I think it will go down in the record books as one of the best road trip playlists ever. Over 20 hours of bangers, classics, yeah. new stuff, experimental, got weird in some spots. I loved it. And uh, so I salute everybody who joined us on the road trip in that regard but um i'll never do it again somebody brought up that i guess early in the podcast mm -hmm. maybe fresh off of a road trip when the first time i drove to nashville which was years ago a different lifetime ago so when somebody brought this up i was like people change man you guys are living in the past literally if you're, it was like episode 80 something they were like alvin i'm listening to this episode 80 something and alvin said he'd never drive to nashville again didn't they drive to nashville for crime con I'm like <laughs> whoever that guy is that you're listening to in the 80s episode yeah, that is a whole different guy. Like, I don't even know who that person is anymore. Wait, somebody okay. said that somebody brought it up. And they're like, yeah, I was like, I'm like, we're on episode 300 and something. So episode eight, yeah. I don't even know what that is in years. That's like at least like four years. Ago. Yeah. Maybe more than that. I don't even know how many there's 52 weeks in a year that I mean, like, I don't even want to sit here and do the math right now. I'm not yeah. I'm not goddamn uh, rain man. But as I said, as I, I would say it's at least five years ago. Man, my life has changed in the last five years. So, um, yeah, I drove to Nashville again. You know why? Because plane tickets are expensive as a mug. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, we're going to get me and my boy down there. We're going to do this little 10 hours and 50 minutes, and we're going to do it in a breeze. It really was wasn't it a... as bad as I thought it was going to be. Exactly. Well, I mean, yeah, well, you were you were passenger princess, but, <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but yeah, but it, but it wasn't. From my perspective, it wasn't that bad either. Yeah. I will never do it again. I'm saying that officially on record now and, and finally as the new Alvin that's here today and the past album that they heard say that five or however many years ago, neither one of us are making that drive again. I will stand on it. I'm standing on business this time. That was the last time I drive to Nashville, Tennessee. Maybe yeah. the last time I drive more than eight hours. Yeah. 
I don't see me doing it again. I just you don't. killed it though, man. I, and I appreciate you driving your uh, safe driving skills. Yeah, give it up to me. It's hard, I, I, it's hard yeah, to, for me to trust a lot of people to put my life in a lot of people's hands. Well, that's why you were a passenger princess. No, I'm neurotic I, and I'm crazy. Car, and I would have drove too. I'm like, yeah. you know what? I, I'm good. I, I'll, I'll take over this. No, I, I will also commend you. You were able to, on the way back, you caught like a little 45 minute Z's. I did. <laughs> I could never, you know what I'm saying? Like, not only could I, do I not feel comfortable leaving my life in many people's hands at all, but I'm definitely not falling asleep. So I, that's a, almost a, a, a homage to me that you trust me enough to be like, let me go ahead and catch this little 45. Yeah. Well, I was, I, but the thing about that, I was, I was fighting it though. Like I couldn't, my body, my body. You could have, you couldn't, you could have fooled me. I looked over, you had the seat reclined back. You had took your do-rag and put it over your face <laughs> like a sleep mask. I was like, oh, he's catching some good no, I had to. <laughs> It's like. It didn't look like you were fighting it at all. I was like, no, this guy nah, I was, went reclinomatic. Uh, it was a couple times where I like, I like said something just to, just to, 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 to so you're aware I'm still awake. <laughs> so like whatever I said then, it was it was total bullshit. I was just trying to throw something out there. So you thought I was still awake? I was fighting. Yeah, at one point you was like, this is, this is a podcast. Yeah. I was yeah, like, I was, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was a child. I was, <laughs> Okay. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's it. All right. Cool. I was fighting about it. No, I can't hold on. I can't hold on no more. <laughs> hey man, listen. We made it. We, we did, did it. it. We made our triumphant return to our families, oh, and now we're back to get recording, man. I'm really happy. We put the first part of our uh, visit to CrimeCon and the great interactions and stuff in the booth out. I yeah. hope people enjoyed that. There's more content that is exclusively on Patreon for the time being. Maybe we'll release that to the public um, sometime soon, or maybe we already have. I'm not really sure when this episode's coming out that we're talking on right now, but. There's things, like I said, we're talking from the past. So there's just some stuff I have to talk about because it's so exciting and I'm, I'm yeah. happy to be talking to Fran about it. Fran. Yes. This Corey Harris story, bro. We need to get into this. The guy, you told me about this on the road yeah. back or maybe while we were out in Nashville. You're like, this guy was driving his car yep. while on a Zoom hearing for a suspended license with the court, the judge. He's on yeah. like a, a FaceTime with the judge and the judge goes, are you driving a car right now as we're speaking about you being in court for a suspended license? He goes, uh, yes, sir. I'm just uh, pulling the car right now. I'll be pulling over and just... He's like steering the wheel with one hand. It's fine the spot. <laughs> I'm about to park the car right now. The judge goes, I, I'm in disbelief. Yeah. The judge was dumbfounded. Gobsmacked. <laughs> Nonplussed. <laughs> He he remanded that man to prison. That he said, "You need to come. You're done. You're you're. Yeah, I'm t- you're it. come turn yourself in by three o'clock today. No bail. You're going to prison or jail. I don't know the severity, but it's a traffic thing. Jail. You're you're going to jail. Then, not a day or two after you tell me this, because we're laughing. Mm-hmm. This guy, what an idiot. Yeah. Two days later, it's like, bro, guess what? He was supposed to be off of that two years ago. This is a miscarriage of justice. He shouldn't even be in jail. He's going to be able to sue the city of whatever the fuck he, wherever he lives. He's about to make $30 million probably if he sues the city. And then people go, wow, what a plot twist that was. Not another 24 to 36 hours after this plot twist. Yeah. It turns out this man sits in court. He never had a license in the state that he lives in. Never had one. The state of Michigan. He never had a license in the state of Michigan. He's never been a licensed driver. At all. Anyway. At all. <laughs> so, so some people liken this to uh, being down 3-1, pushing the game to game seven, and then losing in game seven. Yeah. I don't know what his punishment will be, but this has been the wildest saga. Fran thoughts. Oh, wait. you didn't. So you didn't hear the new news that came out. I don't There's know more? True. Yes. There's been, I saw that he has, he had two warrants out for his arrest. <laughs> Negro, please. Are you serious? Yes. Unrelated. Unrelated. He has two warrants on his arrest. No, nah, man. I don't know how true that is, but like now it's one of those things where people can just kind of build upon this whole thing. And oh, the lore be, of this is gonna yeah, grow. It could be. It could deep. be. It could be false. It could be factual. Whatever. But the, what I saw was like, oh, now he has two warrants for his arrest. Yeah. Now we're just having fun with it. Yeah. But what a wild, wild ride the Corey Harris saga has been. I appreciate him for making our week a little bit more fun. Uh, one more thing I wanted to touch on before we move on to getting into the fucked up shit is yeah. there's this other story that I heard about out of Baraboo, Wisconsin, I believe. It is one of the most. Do you watch Curb? Curb. Curb your enthusiasm. So, yes, I watch. Yeah. Um, this is one of those. See, Larry David, when he does these like crazy, awkward uh, misunderstandings in real life thing, it's hilarious. 
But I saw one that happened in real life at a graduation, and I went, oh, this isn't always... If you're not Larry David, it's not funny. Yeah. So there's this father. I don't want to mm-hmm. use his name because I do think there was a mix-up, unless more information has come out since we recorded. Like I said, we're recording from the past. But there was a father at a graduation. Mm-hmm. Apparently, his daughter was going through some kind of bully incident, and the father didn't like how it was handled by some of the administrators. Okay. And so at the high school graduation, his daughter's walking the stage. Now there's there's four superintendents waiting to shake shake each student's hand as they give, give them their diploma. Mm-hmm. This dad, who is white, his daughter's white as well. There's three three superintendents in front of the last man who's a black man. This this guy comes from out of the crowd onto the stage and, and escorts the black superintendent out of the line of people yeah. as his daughter's walking to shake each person's hand. Yeah. So his daughter gets to the first person in line, shakes that woman's hand, and as this is happening, her father rushes the stage. People are like, oh, what's happening? He pushes this black man out of the out of the camera frame, and you hear kind of an exchange off in the corner, like, hey, man, right. hey, bro, hey, man, get your hands off hands me, man. Off. Right. Hey, man, you better get your hands off me. I hear him going, ah, oh, man, I don't, you're not, don't you talk to my daughter. This now, what I think happened, because a lot of people are going, this was like crazy racism. Okay. If this was crazy racism, this man should be in the Hall of Fame for the most racist thing I've ever seen on camera. And I don't think it's it. I don't think that's what happened. Now, if he did go, my daughter's not shaking some fucking <laughs> hand. You know, like, if that's, <laughs> if that's what happened, obviously super racist. What the word is that's happening officially so far, at least from the past we're recording from, is that, like I said, they didn't, he didn't like the way that the bullying situation was handled with his daughter. Mm -hmm. And so maybe this was the main culprit in handling it wrong. And so he took it out on that specific person. Now that's still racist to go. I mean, there's four other like administrative people out there. Why is this the guy that you're taking it out on? But I don't know the personal relationship. But my point about the Larry David moment is I think to him, he went, I have a vendetta with this person. We don't know the history there. Maybe this was the guy that specifically his daughter went to to get help and it didn't happen. So to him, he goes, my daughter's not shit. This is her day, and he will not ruin it by, by being phony to my daughter. But to the camera, it looks like this white dude in an in a, a, a American flag baseball hat with the sunglasses yeah. on the front, which is the most racist combination of things, <laughs> pushes this black man out of the camera and refuses to let his daughter touch him. Yeah. So I feel like the Larry David curb moment is when he's like, and you people are the worst. But he's, and you, the you people is the administ- the, 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 the superintendents. Right. But it's all on a hot mic. You people are the worst. I'm sick of you people. All you do is mess up things and ruin things. And then he turns around and everybody's quiet. Camera phones are out and can't believe what's happening. He's like, and then he leaves, looks, he's like, only black person. You know, I pushed him. People at the yeah, security yeah. are coming through. He's like, no, no, he no. It's it's because he's he's a bully. Bum, right. Bum bum bum. Yeah. That's what it felt like. It felt very much like this is this looks so racist that it can't be racist in my mind. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, did you I see think, this also? Did you see this? Did you see I, I, yeah, this I saw thing? Video. I saw the video. And uh, the first the first optic, you know, looking at it from the first time, right? Yeah. You go out, immediately you go. We've seen this. We've seen this shit all the time. Where it's just like, no, this dude was whatever. It was racist. It was a racist. Cause I tweeted, but I was like, I was because I was like, also after like when you watch it, do you watch it a few times? You kind of open your mind to other, you know, others, you know, outcomes. Right. Of how this went down, right? So or where this stump, where this whole thing stemmed from. So what I thought was, I was like, man, this dude was just his racism was just killing him. There needs to be action. Well, like look I don't him, want him. Look at him yeah. standing up there in his gotta, suit. Yeah, I got he's something human. Yeah, and then like looking at it a couple times after that, I went, okay, this has to be way deeper than what we can see, as far as what we can see from the video. It has to be yeah, I deep. just for him to just, just go after it's more than one superintendent up there, but you go to the black person, the opposite look of that looks terrible. It but looks I mean, awful. Like, it, it has to awful. be right. It has to be. It has to be something deeper that we don't know all the details about, and hopefully those come out later where we can, because man, throwing that, throwing that term around like that. Racist. I mean, people can use their job. A whole people, somebody whole life can change, especially with his own camera like that. Oh, he's cooked. Like, like I said, I don't, I'm not going to say his name, but his name right. is out there. I'm sure this guy's lost his job. That's why, like, we need to we need to know all the details about what's going. Hopefully, there's more of a backstory to this. But like, we it looks bad. It looks it looks terrible. But like, also throwing that term around when we don't know everything, it's like, you know. So I feel for I feel for some people sometimes. But if you're racist, then you're racist. But like, right. we don't know. Everything. I wish. 
you know, hopefully soon we find out all the details about what exactly happened. Well, here's my issue, right? Is that even if it's the scenario I'm painting, you should be absolutely ashamed of yourself. Like this is your daughter's graduation. Mm. Save that for like whatever was the situation with bullying, or if that's the case, that if that is really what happened, move past it, bro. It's her last day. And it's her special, it's the most special day of her life so far. Yeah. And all she'll remember is awkwardly walking off the stage as her father gets into yeah. a confrontation. Oh, yeah. Everybody in the that. crowd's that's... gasping and shit. Bro, you remember Jamie's dad walked up and pushed a black guy during graduation? No, that's yes. Yeah, <laughs> so it no, looks terrible. Looks, like there's no just looks, she looks yeah. super embarrassed. But I mean, now there's gonna be a story people gonna be able to tell for decades yeah. later, years. Oh. Yeah, you. Yeah. She will never live this moment down. No. And that from that aspect alone, you should be ashamed as a father. Like you really yeah. fucked up. You you let yeah. your pride and your ego, a bunch of other shit, get in the way of a special day for your child. Yeah. So maybe you're not a racist, but you're definitely an asshole because yeah. rushing the stage. At a graduation, is cool. what are you doing? Yeah, I, I actually, I what agree do you think everybody's gonna clap and be like, man, yeah, man, don't let him touch your daughter? No, nah, he didn't care about that. I, I agree with you because I think that regardless of whatever it was, him being racist or something deeper than that, it's just whatever, it's just a handshake, bro. Just because that's what it looks racist, where he's like, yeah, whatever don't happens, I don't want you to take that black man's hand at all. <laughs> so it's like, it, it looks yeah, crazy, it looks, terrible. it looks crazy, but like, wait for that, like, whatever, yeah. ha- whatever it is, just wait. Just wait to the end, and you can kind of handle that, you know, behind closed doors or whatever. But whatever it was, it was killing him inside. He couldn't. He was like, no, I can't. I can't sit up here and do nothing. As two people who graduated from high school, we all know when it's all said and done, there's people mingling outside of the, the auditorium. Like, you could have gone up to that. So you could, there was a, you could have had a moment where you go up to that superintendent for five seconds, shake his hand, pull him in closer, and go, hey, listen, I don't like the way you handled the things with my daughter. Yeah. But, you know, um, I don't really respect how it was handled, but it's over now. You know, she graduated and you have a nice day or or shake his hand, pull him in and go, hey, man, fuck you. I don't like how you handled that. But we're adults and, you know, yeah. don't let me don't let me catch you outside of here. He could have handled it all kind of gangster ways. He could have done it like an adult. He could have been tough about it. But yep. there was there was decorum. There's decorum yeah. to be had. Right. Whatever. Whatever he chose to do it still looks racist. Like it's like, you oh, have to man, it, it looks you so have to know, racist. We have to know where, is, where this is stemming from. He yeah. He could have went out there and shook his hand and wished some in his ears. He gonna look. He's gonna. He's he's white, so he's gonna look all red and shit and angry. Whatever it looks. Whatever he does, people gonna look at him like, oh, whatever he did was just racist right now. Yeah. And he's just gonna look like a bad guy. Yeah. There's no way around the racism. There's like no I said, around. I mean, yeah. I'm 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 asking for context that I don't have. Sure. To make it not racist, just objectively looking with no con- context, the entitlement of him going up in there just pushing his arm and just like moving him. This is his job. Yeah. This man is at work, and you are a person in the audience who needed a ticket to be here. Yeah. If they did, if her, if she didn't have enough tickets, you wouldn't be allowed to be here. He's on the stage. He's working. And you came over there and be like, no, 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 not you. Like, what? You know how many people are graduating and walking the stage? Why is this so special? Why do you have the authority to dictate this man be on the stage because something that happened with your daughter? So it looks entitled and super racist and crazy as shit also. Because, again, like, what did you think was going to happen? Like, did you think everybody's going to go, yeah, man, hold him back there. Don't let him come back over here and stand in line. Hold him back. You keep standing up there. And while he's going, hey, man, hey, get off me. And everybody's going to go, no, don't, don't let him go. It's all good. Just keep holding him back there. It's restrained and detained. Yeah. It's I like, think what if the- whatever the scenario is or whatever, you know, the, the, the info that comes out as far as context, I think if she wanted to stand on her ground and something happened that we don't know about that was super deep that was super deep that we don't know about like she she could have just not shook she could have just walked past him she could have not shook yes. his hand, right and yes. we we all questioned it it went that's racist too either way it was just it all look, it all would have looked super racist <laughs> either way this looks mad racist so that's why i go just just let it go just let yeah. it go yeah you know you came to graduation you bought the cap and gown why are we still holding on to this let it go for the day she even looked like it wasn't like she was like, yeah, dad, fuck him. Yeah. Like she was embarrassed. Like who who was this a win for in your mind? Yeah, this wasn't looked, standing up for your kid. She looked embarrassed. And then when it, it, the camera pans to her sitting down, like it was just her in an empty fucking row. The whole row. Oh, I didn't even see that part. I don't know if maybe that line of people was as in the back walking, doing a little walk. I, ho- I hope yeah. so. Jeez, but for it to be so perfectly bad. in that time frame. She was like sitting by herself. Oh, that sounds so sad and awful. Yeah. So Not when we true. see that, we go like, "This looks like people don't like her, or she's uh-huh. 
Got don't want to be associated. Don't be, yeah, that's what it looked like. Wow. Maybe this is one of those situations where somebody tagged us in the thing. They said that we talked about a kid on Good Vibes, and I remember what that where we talked about him, and it wasn't Good Vibes. It was about that kid who was like a little person, and he was being bullied in school. Um, and then it, yeah, but like, I don't, I don't know what's true or not because now it's been years rolls, or whatever. You know? But it, it said like it turned out that apparently the kid was saying some racist shit or something. Oh, oh. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that was true because they yeah. they let the guy be in. He's in a, the new, new, the new Mad Max movie. Yeah. But my point is maybe it. It's also possible that the thing that she was having an issue with in school was her being racist. Like, that is possible, too. Now I'm yeah. completely speculating. But you know what I mean? Like, we're going, she had an issue in school with bullying or whatever. And and I, that that tugs at my heartstrings. But I go, well, you you say this thing about she was in the row alone. That could have been completely unrelated. I'm just speculating. But she's in the row alone, this thing with her dad. You go, what if her bullying was somebody was threatening to beat her up because she said some racist shit? So it's like, man, it's even hard to even, this yeah. whole story is like, I'm trying really hard to have empathy and sympathy, but it just looks really bad. For sure. Yeah. So hopefully the context comes out so this girl can redeem her name. And I'm not saying I hope she was bullied, but I hope she was bullied for like wearing glasses or something and not because she's uh, a MAGA or something. You know what I mean? Like she's like, like, you got to look at it through all, through all lenses. For sure. Because you can't just go like, you can't just sit up and call them a racist Mm -hmm. because it looks like it. But like, you can't also be like, you know, it's something deeper than that shit. I'm looking at look at through all types of scenarios. We don't know what the fuck happened, but it looks like he's racist. So one thing that's the the number one on the list of possibilities yeah. is that this dude's racist as shit. Yeah. So hopefully he can clear his name. But something tells me he's gonna come out and say the exact opposite of what would be the best thing to say. So um, only time will tell, or time has told, because we're t- we're coming to you from the past. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a quick break, and when we come back, we're gonna get into some fucked up shit. So stick around. Affirmative Murder is brought to you by Kickoff. Have you ever gone up to a vending machine and seen a Rice Krispie Treat hanging by the edge of its life? And you know that if you buy the Rice Krispie Treat behind that, you'll have become a vending machine master, pulling off the two-for-one special, the ultimate beating of the system. That is until Kickoff came into existence. When it comes time to buy a home, a car, or find a new apartment, a bad credit score can be a big roadblock. But Kickoff found a way to beat the system with a fast and easy way to build credit up safely each month. Sign up for a monthly plan in minutes and start building credit right away for as low as five bucks. Listen, folks, credit is complicated. But one thing I know for sure about it is that a good score is necessary in life. You can use AutoPay to build your credit while you sleep and never have to worry about missing a payment. So if your credit score could use a little TLC, which who's couldn't these days, join the over a million people who are building their credit with Kickoff right now. Get your first month for a dollar off at getkickoff.com slash AMP today. That's kickoff at get K I K O F F dot com slash A M as in man, my credit's fantastic. P. This special offer applies to new kickoff premium customers for their first month only and is subject to approval and only available on getkickoff.com slash AMP. Terms of offer are subject to change. All right, and we are back. Fran, what up? Uh, this week we are covering covering a really interesting story that dives into some of the uh, negative aspects of the service and people who sign up and enlist to protect this country. Um, there's not enough services and resources for these people when they come home a lot of times, and they deal with a lot of mental health struggles. And sometimes those things can go bad, whether it's for them personally or for others around them. So. I just wanted to give that little disclaimer and say that that's not okay. These people put their lives on the line, and when they come home, the least that they should have are, is the proper resources to take care of themselves for the damage that they took protecting all of us as a nation. So with that being said, this week our affirmative murder is the story of Brian Brown Easley. So, uh, Fran, Brian was born in 1983 in Williamstown, New Jersey. He was the youngest of eight children. His parents were Bobby Lee Brown and Barbara Easley. I think Brian grew up with, like, some options, but either way, it he ended up enlisting in the military. Uh, he completed mm-hmm. his U.S. Marine Corps training at Paris Island in South Carolina, um, and Brian went on to marry a woman named Jessica Tate and had a daughter named Jayla, which is a very biracial name. 
I think it's up there. Um, Jayla, Jaden. Those are the two. Those are the yeah. boy girl ultimate biracial names, at least of the past. I think now we've gotten to a point where people are just kind of naming their kids kids' names. But I think in maybe like the mid 2000s, I think everybody was super excited about the new wave of like the new crop of biracial kids or something. So they yeah. were like, I'm going to name bad. them something biracial. Right. And those were the two. I can't really think of any other ones, but I would say those are the like the yin and yang, the boy and girl of biracial kid names. For sure, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I'm only assuming. I don't know what this – I didn't look up what his wife looks like, but I would assume that um, she is a, a, a Caucasian. Um, so uh, now Lance Corporal Brian Easley was a supply clerk, and he was serving in Kuwait and Iraq. He was part of the 2nd Marine Logistics Group based at Camp Lejeune. If I said that wrong, I'm sorry. I'm uncouth. It's L-E-J-E-U-N-E. So while he was in Iraq in 2005, Brian served as a warehouse clerk at al Takadum, uh, which is an air base. Uh, he was working up to 17-hour days, and he was supplying orders for Marine combat units that were functioning throughout the Al-Anbar province. 17-hour days? Jeez. 17 What is it like? What is he like? Was it like ammunition or something? Or like, what is he like? I mean, I'm guessing, Ooh. yeah, I'm guessing he's somewhere where they need the stuff around the clock. We're under fire. Yeah. We need more ammunition. We need more whatever. We need you. So 17-hour days is intense. Mm. S- sleep deprivation, the stress of war, all yeah. that shit, compi- com- you that know, it plows on you. Even though he wasn't on the front lines, Brian told a news station that he interviewed with that he had one close call during a security detail. Uh, a fellow soldier named James Dunlap who served with Brian, said that mortar fire was a regular occurrence at the base, often causing everyone to hurry into the bunkers. I just, man, good, shout out to them, but I am, I just, I, I, I couldn't. I just, I just, serving in the military, I just, I just, man, I, I commend it so much, but I'm a bitch, man. I, I'm not, not going to lie. I'm not going to front. I'm not going to pretend that there's any other reason other than that, like I'm, I'm a, I'm a pacifist or I object to the, the wars that this country goes to war for or the, the, the reason that this country goes to war. All of that stuff I might have some thoughts on. But at the end of the day, the, the, I, the notion that people are going to be shooting at me and bombs are going to be falling near me, I'm out. But I respect yeah, everyone yeah. who does what they do. It takes, it takes a different, a different breed for that man. Like, yeah. A different level of like you steadiness. Can, yeah, I don't think you can... Somebody could a, is able to explain how brave you need to be to, to be like, no, nah, I'm a Syria country is amazing. But like for you to like stand on that and be like, no, nah, I'll get behind a gun. And nice. That's, that's it's terrifying. Terrifying. For sure. But it, it couldn't be me. It could not be. I me. deal with too much shit already as a black man in America. And you think I'm gonna go over there and <laughs> man, when I saw that sh- that movie, uh, what was that? Um, what's that movie you told me about with the guy? Um, here we damn go. It, what's, here we go. God okay, well, let's do this. It. Let's do this. Let's do this. Okay, here we go. Um, that guy, I'm guessing, has something to do with war. Yes. Okay. Um, we got the this. Show we had the had the monsters and shit in it. Had the monsters it and shit in it. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Lovecraft Country. Lovecraft Country. That. Starring that. Starring the now defunct Jonathan Majors. Yes. Continue. Jonathan Majors. Um, him. Mm-hmm. When he came home and he was fucking getting rocks thrown at him and shit. Yeah. And oh, in his uniform. Stars. In his uniform. I was like, nah. Now, I don't that's think that's the case as much today. <laughs> but that history still lingers and exists. Yeah, and seeing something like that just not being appreciated. Don't forget that shit. Yeah, not being appreciated for your service. Or even being somebody who serves this country oh, and then getting racism, in. I mean, it's still, it's still around. Yeah, not being in your uniform and experiencing racism as somebody who's taking bullets or shrapnel or being yeah. been shot at in this country would make me literally snap. Yeah. If somebody had the nerve to tell me to go back to Africa or some racist ass shit and a, a bullet hit my helmet. And I'm just in a, gr- a grocery store or, or or a Circuit City or some shit, and you have the nerve to tell me to get out of here. Yeah. Oh, you should run. You should run from me, because I I think something primal would unleash in me. Like your country, yeah. you know what I've seen. You start going on the whole thing. It would get you back. Get your ass out there then. Yeah, it would get. It I'm would, over, I, I went over to fight because so you can run this fucking Circuit City Radio Shack. Whatever yeah. the fuck you were. It would. Yeah, it, it would get bad in that Fye real quick. We just keep saying the oldest stories we can think of. 
Mall. It would get terrible in that Suncoast movie rental uh, movie DVD store <laughs> so quick. It would be bad. It would get real ugly in this Hollywood video. <laughs> <laughs> So after spending four years in the military, Brian was honorably discharged in 2005. After returning home from the Marines, Brian moved back in with his mother in Jefferson, which is in Georgia. Um, yeah. uh, shortly after leaving the Marines, Brian developed back problems from his hard labor on the base. While living with his mother, Brian met his future wife, Jessica Tate, and began a relationship with her. Jessica had been working as a cashier at a Walmart when, when the two of them met. Uh, they they soon moved in together and got married. In 2008, the the couple welcomed their daughter Jayla. Um, the marriage did not last, however. They did eventually separate, and you know uh, Brian was back on his own, with you know time visiting his daughter. As a result of his service, Brian was diagnosed with mental health challenges as well as chronic back pain, which is a very severe gateway to opioid addiction. Now, I don't I don't that's not the way that this went, but it, it could have played a role for sure. Yeah. Uh, Brian had been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, as we know it as, as well as paranoia and schizophrenia. So he is plagued by mental illness, partially, if not fully, as a result of his service in the military. Yeah. But his as we go on with the story, his story is a little bit different, though, for me too. it's hard for me to kind of put it on PTSD and schizophrenia. Okay. For his story specifically. Sure. Uh, Brian was able to hold various jobs in the early years after being discharged from the military, including at a Home Depot distribution center and at a church's chicken. Church's chicken. Slinging birds. Hmm. Can I get to the yum, yum? Ah. Very delicious. Yeah, very probably. Uh, Brian struggled to keep himself afloat with the monthly disability checks that he received from the VA. Uh, the checks were in the amount of $892. Brian would also use his money to, to help pay child support. Whew. So it's rough. Hey, rough. I mean. The deck is definitely being stacked have, against this guy for sure. For sure. You don't have eight, $890 or what? For the month. 2011 is not that long ago, so it's, it's kind of still the same. It's not that much different. $892 right, so in, two, in 2011, based on the economy today, it's probably the equivalent of maybe like $1,400 now. Maybe, yeah, maybe, right. and that's and that's and that's a reach, and that's for the month, yeah. and that's a reach, and that's for the month. That's a reach, and so, it's for the month. That's yeah. like three hundred and fifty dollars a week, right? And you got to cut that. You got to cut that in half, essentially. Cut that in half. You got to live. You have four. You're at home with mm -hmm. your mom, which takes a toll well, like, on you mentally. Like four at, at max, maybe like four fifty something, right? Then you got to buy. You got food, and you, I don't know if he drives or anything like that. But then you got to get to work. Other, other whole bunch of shit you got to pay for. It's there like, is nothing oh. more depressing in the world than not having the gas money to get to work. Yeah, it's like I'm trying to get up and make money, I'm and losing. I don't have money to get the, to the money. Yeah. Oh, it just that's just it's just dark, man. It weighs on your spirit and your soul. I've been there, but I was like 17, right. and it's didn't care. I, don't, you know, I really was like. I won't go to work right now. I'll, I have work in 30 minutes, and I'll call out right now. I'll ride this thing with E until it... And For I work, sure. Work it's a different... Man, being young and broke is it's freeing. Like, it's not... Yeah. Who gives a shit? I don't care. You can buy two things. It's either you pay your phone bill, or you can, like, skip the phone bill and, and buy some food. I'm yeah. Like, and, hey, you know something? That's good enough for me. Good enough for me. And then if you pull, if you are able to pull something off, like a date or something like that, it, all, it was almost like a high. Yeah. Like, shit, I got $8. I'm trying to take this girl to the movies, go get some Buffalo Wild Wings. Nah, well, borrow, I borrow 20 I from the homie. I wasn't, doing that. I wasn't doing that. I don't oh, think we did a lot of movie dates back then. It was more like a group of us, and it was like, hey, bring your stub outside. You come get me. Come get <laughs> stub you come me. Get me. Sub, stub me in. Sub <laughs> and also, by the way, while we're going to say, I've never did that. That was never. You've I never, never been the sub, the stub never, sub? No, never. Yeah. Never. Same. I went. I went. I've I'm always not, been the stubber. Yeah, I'll pay for my ticket, and then I'll mm -hmm. get somebody else my stuff so they can come get you. I, oh, yeah. I don't know. I just didn't like that feeling of looking like a broke dude. Yeah, like, we had a lot of broke bro, friends. Can you get me. Yeah, and and those those tree had no issue with like, bro, you gonna come get me? Yeah, you give me your stub. There's nothing more embarrassing. I would say I wouldn't know. I'm I was the stubber, and same with you. But <laughs> having a text, I had the text message like, "Yo, I'm over by the popcorn." Like, yeah. Whenever you get a chance, I'm gonna settle in. I'm like, oh shit, I forgot to go get this. Broke motherfucker. I'll be right back. You had to get you had your stuff and you had to get a stub from somebody else that so you both can get it. back in. 
you both can get back in. Right. So you don't right, have to right. do those little triggery Man. shit. <laughs> Fucking. Well, the point is, you should not be a father and a former veteran and all these things and have to live this kind of life. We were Absolutely. 16 years old. We're 16 so years I feel old. for him that not being able to take his daughter to go to the movies. And have to, having have to, to stub your kid? Oh. Yeah. That's like some pursuit of happiness. And I'll cry. I'll come get you. I'll be back. I'll try. I'll come get you before the trailer I'll starts. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh my God. So sad. Wow. Yeah, but I mean, child support, I don't, I don't, um, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not gonna get my thoughts on child support, but for his situation, it, it sucks. It for sucks. sure. Yeah. So um unfortunately and sadly, in 2011, Brian's mother died which began a period of time in which Brian bounced around between various living situations that included a Department of Veterans Affairs, Mm -hmm. or a VA, uh, a mental health hospital, and inside of his car, because his mother was his only means of being able to afford to have a roof over his head. Which is This is a a man who served the country, and when his mother passed away, this is also a, 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 a lesson in financial literacy to black people. Obviously, everybody needs financial literacy. But the idea that his mom had a home, whether or not she owned it or not, I guess is the is the question. But that when she passed away, he everything that he had secure was gone. Yeah, that he ended up being essentially homeless, living in a car. So that speaks to life insurance policies, having your deeds in order. I don't again, I don't know if she had a home. Like that. Yeah, she might have just yeah. been able to pay the rent at the place that he was allowed to stay at. But Possibly. for your mom to pass away and it be a net loss. You know, death is always tragic, but when you should be able to leave your kids something that's a gain. And this is not I'm not disparaging his mom, yeah. but like I mean, it just le- it it put him in a, a bad spot. Yeah, but but you but that's that's another that's another finance that you have to deal with. I yeah. mean, like you keeping up with the policies. Not, yeah, yeah, life insurances are not free. You got to pay for that. So if she hasn't, she couldn't afford that. Then I mean, you just I don't know what else he's supposed to do. Yeah, he just he, nothing. I mean, like also, but that's super important. Yes. Super important. Obviously, let me just be clear. If you can't afford something, that's of course. But right, if it's right. just a, a concept of you don't know, you're hurts, just, you don't know, then I mean, we should fix that. We need to fix that as a absolutely. people. We need to fix it as a race of, of humans, not just black people, but as a race of humans. But I'm speaking specifically to black people because it seems to be a little skewed of where the knowledge is. I hear that, you know, this, 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 obviously, this conversation probably happens to people of all walks of life, but I hear it a lot more in people in my community where, you know, Somebody dies. They don't. They didn't have their will in place. All these yeah, things. Like, these yeah. are all conversations that need to be had. We can't stop. Yeah. Can't keep fearing death, people. It happens, and we should try to make sure we leave something behind for the people that care for us and care yeah. about us. And that is, and that is probably whatever um, a majority percentage of why there's such a gap in generational wealth as far as white people and black people. Yeah, it just it just sets you back when it, paying for a funeral, not losing a house to the state, you know, or to the banks because they we didn't we didn't. Have, because if the bank will take your house, if there's no will to say this house goes to this person, the bank is going to take your house. Yeah. Or your mom's house or your dad's house. The bank's taking it. If they don't, if you guys can't figure out who, who, who has the house, who gets the deed, the bank gets the deed. So that's an asset lost. Big Mama's house is gone. We don't have Thanksgiving there anymore. The bank took it. <laughs> why, why is it be Big Mama's house? Well, it's not the movie. I was, you know, I was thinking of soul food, but... Um, we all have a big mama, you know. <laughs> we, I, we all, she's big mama to somebody out there. I get that, but why do you have to call it? Why it has to be? Why you have to? Because I'm talking to us, man. Because I'm talking to us. I'm trying to relate, you know. Is that what did I just do the Hennessy thing? I did the guy that, yeah, at the bar. Just say the just the family. I'm house. black, like, man. Mom, I wasn't. Mom, yeah, you can't. House. Nobody hey, can take it house? that way. I'm black, man. You know. No, but you're, no, when you say that, that's crazy, man. You can't say that. <laughs> Why can't I say that? No, you can't say I can't say Big Mama's can't. house? No, man. What about Big Mama's house, too? No, that's because you're inferring that. No, you just can't say that because <laughs> people don't think that Big Mama's house, now you're putting us in, in the box was like, oh, we're talking about a, a, a grandma who's big, who likes to cook, diabetes. It's just so much <laughs> shit that's involved with like Big Mama's house. I don't like the term, man. It's just, I don't like it. Don't use that. <laughs> my bad. There's hey, negative connotation. Hey, my it. bad, King. Hey, with listen. That, my bad, King. I did not mean to dis- I did not mean to disrespect. I will not use that terminology anymore. It won't happen again. Uh, <laughs> I will not use Big Mama. Don't, don't, uh, you over here being Hennessy. We, <laughs> we just talked about this. The other day, when a guy, you know, saw you and was like, no, you want some of this hen, you're doing the same thing to our people. You want man. some of this hen doggy. Right. You want some of this hen doggy dog? I was like, wow. All right. Okay. He's grandma's house, mom's house, Big Mama's house. <laughs> no, you're going to have to say that. So, 
um, like I said, you know, just financial literacy and let's uh, get ahead of the death that is imminent for all of us. Anyway, so like I said, this guy, Brian, he struggled with money. He struggled to have a, you know, to find a home. And uh, he was barely keeping himself afloat with the money from his disability that he received from the VA. Um, um, he would also struggle with paying his child support. So he, it was just hard for him to make ends meet, really, honestly. It was, just, it, was, it was a real struggle for this guy. And on top of all that, he now is essentially without a home. Uh, Jessica, his ex-wife, reported that Brian was sometimes barely around to help care for their daughter. Brian did buy a cell phone for his daughter to use to assist with her homework. You know, so that's, you know, that's a good. Yeah, I was out. It doesn't seem like he's absent. I mean, I don't know. Much, he's got a lot on his, you know, like, I don't yeah, know. I mean, like, it's only so much somebody can do. Yeah. I get kids. I, we all understand that. But when it comes to your, your mentals and this guy doesn't have a house, it's like, I'm giving you child support too. It's like, <laughs> all right, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do my best. Yeah. Right. It's like, she wishes like, you would take her to the park. It's like, I live cool. in a park. I, I live in a park. Want to take it to my house? My house is the park. So I give you half of what I got. I can't, I can't even get a spot. Yes. So, and this, you know, Brian would also call her almost every night to pray with her, his daughter. So he got her a phone. He's trying to call her and communicate with her, but he just doesn't have the financial means to be the present force that I'm, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say, maybe he would like to be, I'm guessing based on him calling her and praying, her, so. praying before bed every night. If we, if everybody had a million dollars, I think we all would want to be more, more, Absolutely. more present parents. I think that that's kind of the the sign of the worst type of parent. If you are financially stable and you still are an absent parent, I think yeah. that just means you're not interested in the job. But it's like, man, listen, I'm hungry. I'm, I'm homeless. Like I, I don't, I'm embarrassed. I don't want my kid to see me like 100%. this, you know, that's probably the most important thing. Yeah. You know, it's you being embarrassed. Yeah. So that's so your lot. kid don't, obviously your kid is like, I don't, they don't, they doesn't don't care, care at all. Yeah. It's like, sure. You, you're like, I don't want my child to see me this way. It's a pride. Walk, I, got, I got a bag. I got my uh, fucking military green bag. Yeah. My dad have his a bag all the time. Or like, why is there a pillow in the sheet in the back seat of the car whenever you pick me up? It's like, I don't want to have yeah. to explain that to my kid. Right. That's yeah. just fucking sad. So, uh, Brian attempted to get an education at Lincoln College of Technology. On July 3rd, 2017, uh, financial constraints made it difficult for Brian to continue his education at Lincoln Tech. Um, the VA had not yet given Brian his usual $892 check, so his money's late, which led him to visit the VA's regional benefits office for an appointment, which is a, an appointment was essentially, where the fuck is my money? I live paycheck to paycheck, yeah. and it's not here. I Stressful. Got, and, I don't, I gotta, and I don't blame him not one bit. Yeah, it's nothing it's like waking up. Yeah, you wake up on whatever day and you get, and it's like the money hasn't, didn't drop. And by the way, it needs to be... What is up with all the resources and you know, should be certain should be special jobs for these for these people who are you know, who are um former uh you know veterans. I mean yeah. like what's the I don't understand why that's there. See, I've seen people homeless was like I'm a I'm a veteran and I and they got they had a one and a half leg and yeah. a wheelchair as for me. It's like why don't why are there not these people and sectors this, this sectors goes, for these people for these right people. these kind of go this kind of goes back to the conversation we had was like these take a different type of people to serve their country like yeah. These people decided to serve the country, go through what they go through, the bullets whispering, you know, mm -hmm. past their head and all kinds of shit, and they get, you know, now their term is over, or however, however that works, contract. Mm -hmm. Now I, we don't have, there's not housing, there's not, you know, jobs. Like, what's, that's crazy. There's not jobs in the military where people don't need to be Yeah, retired, on the retired service. I mean, you that's know, insane. having some kind of security contract with a Walmart or a Target where you go, um, these people are trained. You know how much, it, it costs millions and millions of dollars to make a soldier. So the US, U.S. government spends all these millions of dollars on yeah. a soldier and to you get... Go with, and you go, I think you pick a skill when you go into the, I think there's like, you, we can do... You're a specialist. You know, yeah, know, yeah. A specialist in something. Mm -hmm. They don't have a... That no doesn't translate, that doesn't translate to, that doesn't translate to something home. There's nothing that train. So we only train people. We spend millions of dollars to train them to do a specific thing that we it doesn't translate in any kind of way. Yeah, I find that hard to believe. So I just feel like um, it's 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 poor structure because sure. it really and is just. Like it feels like they're just thrown away. Like it feels like what we spent all these millions to get you yeah. to so for you to learn how to uh, 
load a rifle, shoot a rifle, load a cannon, Training do all skills. these things, yeah. and now you're done. Yeah, and then now we don't we don't need you anymore. Yeah, because you're old age or you have some type of injury that you you know you can't. Yeah, you were you you you, you so, here's your purple heart. Now go good luck. I don't what I'm gonna do with this. Yeah, I need a job. I <laughs> yeah, I need work. Yeah, man. Yeah, so he goes to the benefits office for an appointment. There was an incident, and police police handcuffed Brian, which I'm sure triggered for sure. all kinds of you know trauma and and things that are going on in his head. The VA claimed that he had been belligerent, and eventually the police released him from custody. So they 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 detained him to calm him down, but he was not arrested. Um, he did not get the money he was supposed to get. So now it's like. I came over here for nothing. I was hassled, and I didn't even get a resolution to my problem. Yeah. And I still need to eat. Uh, my, my fucking my daughter's phone bill that I pay uh, that's due. Yeah. It's gonna that's gonna cut. She's calling me, so her phone's gonna get cut off. People are calling me. I have things I need to take care of. Brian was scheduled to return to the VA three days later, so he made another appointment. The regional VA benefits office and veterans crisis line had repeatedly turned him away. Brian knew that he was soon to be homeless and living on the streets without this money from uh, his monthly payment. If he, if he didn't get this money, he was not going to be able to live indoors. Like, it's, it's that desperate. It's that uh, immediate of an issue. So uh, things got worse. The VA ended up recouping his monthly payment distribution because Brian had failed to complete the college courses that he was enrolled in, which I don't even... Like, I guess they pay, like, maybe there's some kind of grant that they pay for it or something. And maybe because he didn't complete them, the money that they paid in advance, they went back. Yeah. I would guess it's that some kind of thing like that. Like, we'll pay for your classes, but if you don't finish the classes, we want the money back. So because we paid the money out, we're going to take it out of your $892 since you didn't finish the classes. So, uh, this recouping resulted in the courses no longer being covered by the GI Bill tuition assistance program. Yes. So, yes, that, that is exactly what happened. The VA claimed that they had mailed five letters to Brian about the tuition issue, but never received a response. I mean, he doesn't have a home. This is the kind of stuff, man. I mean, it's just all the bureaucracy of, well, we couldn't find you. We, we, we sent you a letter five times. Like, to where? Do you not, do you not have a permanent address? Yeah. And I'm just trying to go to school and, and get an education, and, and y'all are sending me letters to who knows where, telling me that something's about to be taken away from me. I need to go do this do, or follow up about this, and I, I'm not receiving that mail because I don't have a I don't have a home. On the morning of July 7th, 2017, Brian walked into Wells Fargo Bank in Marietta, Georgia. He slipped the teller a note that stated that he had C4 explosives in his backpack. He gave everyone in the bank except two employees time to evacuate the bank. It was later discovered that there was no bomb inside Brian's backpack. The backpack contained a Bible, various papers, a small machete, and several minor items of little significance. Maybe to the world, but, maybe, but they could have been very significant to Brian. If he packed them yeah. for, for a mission like this, I don't think they had little significance. Brian called 911 and a local news station and explain his perspective. While on the call with the news station editor, Brian emphasized that his financial struggles and, and his struggles in general to maintain essentials like food and water and housing were desperate. Yep. Brian told WSB-TV during his call from the bank, I'm going to be out on the street tomorrow. I have a hotel room for tonight, and tomorrow I have nothing. I'm just going to be out on the street, homeless, no food, no nothing. I don't have much money left, not to survive the rest of tomorrow. Brian's paranoia and schizophrenia were evident in the call to the news station. And when he told the editor that he was being followed and had been the target of four kidnapping attempts, people really started to take this more serious. Obviously, it was pretty serious at the time. You know, you think he has a bomb and stuff. But like now you're starting yeah. to go, oh, this, might, this guy might be unstable. Um, he had blamed the attempts. He oh god. He blamed the attempts on a secret society, and his half brother Calvin. Uh, Brian claimed, "I don't know these people. They seem to be able to track me everywhere I go. They have my information." 
Brian said now, his. I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I, I um. Now, when I said at the beginning of the show, like obviously he was dealing with some paranoid schizophrenia, but like part of that was I'm. I think that the whole hype of this and the what's going on and him been getting excited kind of maybe promoted some of that paranoia and schizophrenia. But I also think that the other half of it is like, I'm trying to survive as well. Yeah. And all this shit going around could have, you know, kind of could have sparked that up. But I mean, like, he's like, I need to, I need to eat. He's in his right mind. I mean, he's like, I need to eat outside of the, the shit people follow him. He's like, oh, I need to eat. I don't have any money. I'm about to be homeless. Like, and I don't think that people are going to see, hear that story in the hear. He's talking about people following him and shit like that, and kind of write all of that off and go like, "Oh, this dude is just crazy." Right. And I and I and I, I honestly, I just don't think that's fair. For sure, you can be desperate and hungry and on the verge of homelessness and be mentally ill, and those things should not be conflated. You know, like um, they shouldn't cancel each other out. Like, well, but you did something crazy, so everything's crazy. Yeah. And they didn't give him his money. Now. Was he trying to go to school? It's just, it, it's very, it's a tough one. It's a very tough one. It, it really speaks to the fact that, and my whole thing is, it shouldn't be this tough for somebody to serve their country. I think that's what it goes back to. In a, in a perfect world, you are brave enough to enlist and protect your country and, and protect home soil and all these things. This shouldn't be the route when you get back home. Right. It shouldn't be this drastic and can't find help and can't get assistance or a job or mental health you know resources it just it just shouldn't be this way yeah and i think you know with him going to school he tried to go to school but when you have so much stress it's like i don't know so I, I don't know what i'm gonna eat today you know and we study right. like, fuck, the, fuck school man i'm not work. some people i mean some people that'll push them that'll motivate you to go like no i'm trying to get out of my situation but then like to to go through what he's gone through to have ptsd and all these, yeah. like that mm-hmm. is like a child, awesome. that, yeah, a ch- my, yeah. My daughter, I, no, like I want to be there for my daughter. I need to eat. I don't have, I don't have a home. I'm in a, 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 the shittiest of the shittiest hotels or motel, whatever he's staying in. It's mm-hmm. like, and fuck the school. I can't study right now. Fuck that school. Then if you ain't getting your money. I don't know. Hell no. <laughs> Worry about no school right now. <laughs> right. Nah. So uh, Brian said his goal was not to hurt anyone or to rob the bank. Brian only intended to get his usual eight hundred ninety two dollar check. That's all he wanted. All he wanted. He ignored the stacks of cash that and that an employee had left sitting out prior to fleeing the bank. So the money was right there. He just wanted his money. And it seems like yeah. he wanted his money from the VA bank account. He's like, I'm not trying yeah. to steal money. I want my check for $892 printed out and given to me. I'll go over to the ATM machine that's over in the corner, pr- put it in the machine so it goes into my bank account. I don't want money. That's I don't want one. stolen cash. Yeah. And I think that's and I think that's that speaks volumes. I think that says a lot. Like he wasn't trying to rob. He just wanted his, he wanted his money so he can survive. Yeah. Ever. And then it's like all the other shit. I don't need all that, man. I just want my money. I just want my money. It's, I mean, like that's that says a lot for him. Well, this whole and thing. Think, yeah, this whole thing. Details like yeah, go ahead, yeah. Sorry. Details like that. I feel like are probably some of the details I get put out to the public last. Yeah. Because it changes the well, whole. Well, the C4 and the former veteran yeah. and schizophrenia, yeah. all that stuff that's grabs the yeah. For sure. But it's like he must have wanted a million dollars. Like, no, he wanted $892 because he was on his last leg and he was about to be homeless tomorrow. Yep. It's very John Q. Yeah. Oh, that's, oh, I love that movie. Yeah. Love John movie. Q was like, I'm here. I've tried to, I've sold my truck, my house. Yeah. I did fundraisers, milkshake drives, lemonade stands. I, I don't have the money to buy a heart. I'm not letting my son die. No. So y'all are going to give me a heart. That's I tried to do it the right way. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> my son's not not getting a heart. So this guy Brian was like, "I went to the office, y'all arrested me. Yep. I tried everything. This is the bank I come to when I get my check every week. I'm here at this bank. Access the bank account that has eight hundred ninety two dollars in it and give me my money. I'm not robbing the bank. I don't want to rob anything. I just want my eight hundred ninety two dollars. I'm owed it. Yep. I've served this country. I would like my money, please." And as crazy as it sounds, there's something admirable about that. Yeah. You know, there's something to go. He He's not going to just take this lying down. And he's not overcompensating. He's like, I. No, not being great. No. No. 
One of my favorite yeah. scenes in a movie. It's another a Denzel Washington movie. It's Denzel Washington and Idris Elba in um, American Gangster. And Denzel Washington plays Frank Lucas. He goes up to this guy who's, who playing, who's playing another street, street drug dealer who Idris Elba's playing. Mm-hmm. And he goes, hey, man, you owe me money. His, he brought, he's brought his whole family up from Virginia to New York or whatever. And they're all sitting in a diner watching him. It's a broad daylight. Denzel Washington, who's playing Frank Lucas, Lucas, goes up to this other gangster guy and he's like, hey, man, you owe me money. And the guy's like, oh, I owe you money, man. I mean, I get the fuck out of here. He, he, Denzel Washington pulls out his gun, puts it right to his face. Yeah. He goes, what are you going to shoot me, man, in broad daylight? He, he didn't believe that he would do this at all. Yeah. He shot that man in broad daylight in the middle of the I street. Mean, he fell to the ground. He went in his pocket. Me, right? Say it again. Then he go to like a diner after. <laughs> his, his family was in the, he was at the diner yeah, already. Yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he shoots this man in broad daylight, goes in his pocket, takes out a wad of cash, takes how much money he's owed, yeah. put the rest in a sugar jar, walk back to the diner. Sat down and continued having the conversation with his family. Yeah. It's one of the hardest things I've ever seen, but it was in that moment you go, he could have took everything. Yeah. It's, so it's like, is that awful? Because obviously we're talking about a guy who went into a bank, said he had C4, terrified a bunch of people. That's all awful. But there's this principled stand in, I don't care about this money you left on the stand. I'm here for $892. He also let some people go. And, and that part too. The people he left there with, Two people that work employers was like, well, I can't get the money if y'all don't give to me. Yeah, I need one. Of you I guys. need y'all got to access the system. Change or something. Yeah, yeah. So the man was like, no, nah, I need, I need my eight, I need my eight ninety two. I gotta pay my child support, and then I gotta get pay my room or whatever. I don't, I don't even know what else he has to do. But like that's and that's all he got. He could have took that body of cash. And like fuck this. Yeah, I'm up. Oh. <laughs> I'm up. Can I get to the yum yum? Ah. So uh, Brian's ex-wife, Jessica, reported that he wanted to surprise their eight-year-old daughter, Jayla, with a dog. Dogs cost money. Jessica thinks that when the payment from the VA didn't arrive, he realized he would no longer be able to come through on that surprise. It's possible that this caused him to reach his breaking point and decide to go and uh, go into the bank. Yeah. So that's the stressor. That's the moment. That's, you know, put, put potentially. We'll never know, which we'll get to why we'll never know. But again... When you talk about, I have a kid on the way. You have two kids. This idea that through no circumstances of your own, really, you aren't going to be able to come through and do something for your child has to be a feeling that it it, it, hit, it hits you in your core. Yeah. Yeah, especially if you rarely see him already. That's, yes. That's, that's, that's a big deal. So after police and SWAT arrived on the scene, a crisis negotiator named Sar- Sergeant Andre Bates called the bank, and began talking with Brian. Sergeant Bates attempted to relate to Brian by discussing their experiences in the Marine Corps. Sergeant Bates pleaded with Brian to release his hostages, reminding him that his life and honor were worth more than $892. Sergeant Bates convinced Brian to let one of the two hostages go in exchange for a pack of cigarettes. This exchange gave Sergeant Bates hope that the situation was heading uh, in a positive direction. However, confusion ensued early in the afternoon when a gunshot was fired at Brian Easley, killing him and ending the standoff. Mm. Brian was shot in the head with a single bullet by Cobb County Police Department officer Dennis Ponte, a sniper on the force with a military past. So he was killed by one of his own brothers. And I hate to put it that way, but I mean, there is some irony and tragedy in that, that somebody who didn't have to go through the same struggles as Brian found a job, found a, a career after after his service, is the yeah. one that killed him. Juxtapositioned in life, but took a similar pathway, but one the outcome was good for one, and the outcome was a lot more of a struggle for the other. Yeah. And one of them ended the other's life. So, Officer Ponte had been hiding in the woods and let his commander know that he had a clean shot and asked if he could take it. He was told, not at this time. Officer Ponte made the decision himself to take the final shot that killed Brian. In his testimony at trial, Officer Ponte offered no logical justification for his decision to use deadly force to resolve the incident. He was literally told to stand down. Yep. Officer Ponte violated two Cobb County Police Department police's, police officers when he decided to take that shot. A tactical solution must only be implemented should communication with the subject fail to resolve the incident, and the ultimate decision will be made by the on-the-scene commander. So, 
the crisis negotiator was able to get some headway. The person in charge of the sniper, Officer uh, Ponte, told him to stand down and not take the clean shot. And he, yeah. he, he negated all directives and took the shot anyway. Fully disgusting. However, a grand jury cleared Officer Ponte of any wrongdoing in Brian's death. It was determined that Ponte acted within the law, even if this action may not have been necessary, which I find to be absolutely disgusting and crazy to come to that conclusion. It's like, did your person in charge of you tell you not to take the shot? Yeah. Well, why'd you take the shot? Well, I just felt like he had a gun, and I just thought he might kill somebody someday. So I decided to... It was like, well, did you know that he he let a hostage go? Yeah, but there's still another hostage. I had a clean shot, and I took it. What? And they went, free to go. Yeah. It wasn't necessary. I don't think a headshot was necessary. He yeah, I mean, to end his life. He wasn't holding somebody hostage with a gun to their head where it's like, all right, but this is the only shot we got. Yes. To take him out. If that was the scenario, I would fully understand. But this is a situation where one of the hostages have been let go. I would assume they're sitting at a table or something. It wasn't a, a, a forearm around the neck of the hostage, gun right. to their temple, and you see a little bit of a peak of their head outside of the around the side of the other hostage's head. And yeah. so you took the shot. It's like, you, this guy was sitting around, maybe on the phone, who knows what. And you shot him dead. I find that to be absolutely disgusting. And then there's no yeah. accountability for that. Now, again, I'm not saying he's right for being in a bank and saying he had C4. We don't even, he didn't even have a gun. He didn't have C4. He didn't even have C4. But that's what he said he had. So, again, right. he didn't even yeah. have a gun. So the scenario that we're even hypoth like being hypothetical about literally couldn't happen because there was no gun. So he saw nothing. And yeah. killed this man, shot him in his head. Neck shot, shoulder shot, or something like that. Even if you shot him in the shoulder and he bled out and he died, you go, you go, man, that's sad, but I mean, I don't know, it he had a shot. A fatal headshot. Yes, it's like, headshot is like, there's no, you killed him. Like, there's no, yeah, you, you intended to, for him to be your dead. Intended, your intentions was to kill him. Yes. Which is shot him in the disgusting. arm or something like that, in the thigh or something like that, where it's like, all right, well, he's down. Now we, now. Now medical attention, now we try to get to him. Right. And if we can't get to him and he died, that's sad, but. You just wanted to incapacitate him, neutralize the situation, whatever. It's like, no, no. You were like, I'm about to kill the fuck out of this guy. And yeah. that might speak to Officer Ponte being a former military officer, and that might just be his training, taking over in the moment. And I don't, I don't think, well, yeah, true. That could happen. But I don't think that. Not saying he's not responsible, he like he didn't think. But I'm just saying, like, he go, in his mind, he might have gone, I got a clean shot. And in my world, before this life as a police officer, a clean shot means eliminate the target no that's that's an excuse then something he's fair. not mentally then he shouldn't be a police officer yeah <laughs> he shouldn't have that job right because i'm sure that when you come out of the military you have to be mentally fit to to get on a swat team yeah or something like that. make decisions and if he's if yeah. he's out there being reckless like that then he shouldn't have that job also when whoever what is his uh officer ponte making that decision there's something more than i don't want to go here because I don't know if this guy's white or black. I don't know. We don't know. So, yeah, but okay. But I, I'm going to hear you out. But I, we don't know. Let's make that we don't clear. Know. But, right. But I mean, like, for you to to act on a decision like that and not To defy a directive, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, it had, I feel like it has like, to. Go ahead, I mean, go ahead and stand down. Uh, we're not going to take the shot right now. He takes his earpiece out. He's like, man, fuck all that. <sighs> so what But what? So, so what other reason? Why, why would you do? Why would you do this? I mean, like. Because the danger, I mean, but he doesn't have a gun. Is he really a threat? I mean, he they don't know if he if the C4 is real or not. Yeah. He hasn't put Again, this is one know. of those, this is one of those situations very similar to the guy at the graduation where you go, even if you start to question and give him some leeway, you go, Well, maybe he heard the word C4 and he knows how dangerous C4 can be because he was in the military. You go, if you're living in the military mindset of like you're in Qatar or Afghanistan or something, yeah, you shouldn't be you shouldn't be a police job. officer. Shouldn't be a sniper shooter at that. Yeah, because because if you're going, I, if you're going, your 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 person in command said stand down, and you go, well, I know how dangerous C4 can be. If it blows up, it could take everybody out. I saw it firsthand when I was in yeah. Kuwait. You thinking that because you were in the military, and this is all speculation, but you think you're in the military and you know what C4 is and how dangerous it is, and that your uh, instincts circumvent the person in charge of you, you should not be a police officer. No. If you think you're more qualified than the person in charge of you to make de to make decisions, and so you de defy an order and kill somebody, you shouldn't be a police officer. So right. maybe he thought he was going to be a hero. Maybe he thought it was Die Hard. He's gonna. Yeah, yeah. He thought he was John McClane. Yeah, but also, 
I'm not saying that this last victim life didn't matter because obviously all these people's lives matter, right? Mm-hmm. As far as these innocent people, but there wasn't there wasn't a for him to, if he was if that was the scenario he made that decision where it's like I know I know the damage of C4. There wasn't the bank wasn't full of people. He let most of it was one other person in there. So I mean, like, and he and the crisis negotiator had just negotiated a hostage being released. Right at the worst, obviously, I don't want nobody to die. Of right? course, but at the at the worst possible outcome, this could happen. He blows up the bank, and it's him and that one other person. They, had, I feel like, again, I'm not an expert. I don't know. I don't know shit. I'm a bitch. I like I said at the beginning, at the beginning of the story. I feel like. He cur- the the crisis negotiator carried enough favor with Brian, and I feel like Brian carried enough favor with the bank people, the the police officers yeah. outside, by letting people go out of the gate and all the things that he did to go. I don't think this guy wants to hurt people. I don't think this is a terrorist attack. I think we have a mental health crisis at, at, at hand, and now the crisis negotiator has gotten him to release a hostage for an exchange for a pack of cigarettes. Even for what he got, you go, this guy's stressed out, man. Give him a pack of cigarettes. He let a person go for a pack of cigarettes. I think that's headway. Yeah. And this guy, and this guy, Officer Ponte said, man, fuck all of that. I'm taking this shot. Let's end this now. I'm a hero. Guns are blazing. I'm Brett Favre. I'm John McClane. I'm a, I'm, this is Die Hard 3. I'm jumping over the car hood. Barrel roll. And you go, then you shouldn't be a cop. You shouldn't no. be a police officer. You shouldn't be a sniper. You should maybe, I don't know. So when I even when I said, you know, Brian's life went this way, and Officer Ponty's life, he he came out of the services and found a way. Maybe he didn't find a way. Maybe he's just as fucked up as Brian is and was able yeah. to hide it in a, in a uniform and, and, and a clean yeah. haircut. Yeah. yeah. But he might have his own PTSD that he's dealing with, that he decided to handle that situation that way. But anyway, questions have been raised about why Brian was shot and killed by the police. For a while, the public was not aware of Sergeant Bates' attempts to end the situation peacefully but through crisis negotiations. Some suggested that racial bias and bias against those with mental illness might have played a cause of Brian being shot by that police officer. Mm. Uh, while, not mm. ex- while not excusing his actions, Brian's half-brother, Calvin, who, he, who Brian had accused of being his evil half-brother, who was you know setting him up by being tracked and stuff, Brian's half-brother, Calvin Easley, had been quoted as saying, they didn't have to kill him. He just wanted to get his story out. Yep. And, um, yeah, so that was the story of Corporal Brian Brown Easley. Uh, he was killed at a bank trying to get $892 of his money that he earned by serving his country. Yep. Absolutely tragic uh, turn of events. And um, it's also very um, interesting. I've heard about this story for some for some time, and there's actually a movie, like a biopic about this story. That is, really? Uh, yeah, that is, um, it's, it's starring John, John Boyega. From Star Wars and from They Clone Tyrone, he's in a lot of good stuff. Um, and uh, I haven't watched it, but I think I definitely will sit down and watch it sometime soon. Um, Fram, what are your thoughts before we uh, close things out? Um, obviously, I think this dude was wrongfully killed. Sure. Um, but I think he just wanted to, without him saying a lot, and. And this whole thing, I think he just kind of wanted to go out there like, look, I just wanted, I just wanted my eight hundred dollars to so I could survive the next week or month. I mean, like this has to last him, last him through a month. Yeah, right. I mean, I'm just trying to get by, I'm trying to get by. And it's like I think he was just trying to like, look, I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want a million dollars. I don't want whatever. I'm not trying to rob the bank, you know, clean. I just want what I what I think I'm rightfully owed. Yes. And that was it. And then I think he was killed wrongfully by this person who's unstable and he shouldn't he, he need to obey and for him to get off on this yeah pretty wild it's nuts yeah, it's nuts wild. it's nuts and i guarantee he this person probably lived his life and if he's still alive or whatever but like doesn't regret doesn't regret anything i don't know well we can't ever know that but i mean the, his actions speak for themselves for sure yeah i agree with you i think it was a wrongful murder um i feel for his daughter and Hopefully hearing his story in full on platforms like this in the movie that they did and in other people's story, other veterans telling the story and relating to the story. Hopefully people can see the empathy and try not to be so black and white about the situation and understand that this is a person who was struggling yeah, and uh, can see the wrong in this. Yeah. I, which and I don't think is hard to see. Right. 
And it's unfortunate that like, you know, he doesn't have his mom around and he's not married to for somebody to to tell his story and to like to take this to the courts. Cause like like I think this is a lawsuit need and something. Cause yeah. there's no way. It was there's pretty no egregious. It was pretty egregious. Like yeah. Once you prove in, in a court of law, you go, so hey, so somebody told you to stand down, and you go, yeah. And you didn't listen? No. It somebody should be feels like the there's the lawsuit right there. It feels like I mean that yeah. feels like there's the civil lawsuit right there. And maybe there was one, and I don't have that on hand. Obviously, I, if if it did right. happen, I don't have that information in front of me. But it feels like there's the lawsuit right there, suing the police department, suing the city, yeah. something. I don't know. But yeah, so um, rest in peace to Brian Easley. I feel like that should be said. Uh, I think I think that's a fully justified thing to say. I don't see this guy as an evil person or a bad person. I see this guy as a cir- uh, victim of circumstances. And a guy that just wanted to eat, wanted yeah. to spend time help. with his daughter, buy his daughter a puppy. Yeah. He needed help. Yeah, not a bullet. Yeah. Uh, before we get out of here, Fran, you been watching anything good? Got any recommendations? Uh, you got anything? Nah, man. Uh, I'm just trying to still get settled in back home. I'm back to work. Yes. Well, I wouldn't say unfortunately. But I am back to work, and I'm just trying to get uh, – Got to get the house back in order now. Now the big daddy's home. Got to get the house back in order. Big daddy, wow. Uh, so uh, I am officially back to work as well. That's, congratulations, man. Thank you, man. Thank you, thank you, man. It, it couldn't have come at a better time. It couldn't have come at a better time. I want to thank everybody who donated to the GoFundMe sure. that Fran sure. set up for me. Anybody who sent, like, prayers and, con- you know, condolences and just well wishes. Anybody that sent my baby a fucking uh, a gift. Thank you to yeah. everybody, which we will be doing a baby shower soon. Uh, me and Fran will be doing a baby, a, a guy, a guy shower, two shower, a shower, a shower with two guys. We're going to be yeah. doing a shower and thanking everybody from the podcast listenership who sent us a, or, or sent, you know, sent me and my, and my girlfriend a uh, gift for our baby child. Uh, we're going to be sitting down, opening some stuff up, saying some thanks and just kicking it. Me and Fran and, and, and you guys, uh, uh, that'll be coming very soon. But again, yeah. thank you guys so much to anybody who supported in that way. Um, for me personally, I will say I did start watching on Netflix the TikTok uh, documentary about a cult that was started by somebody through TikTok. So far, the I first saw that was it. Is it good so far? The or first was it episodes like, are, like a series. Or? Well, it's three parts. It's a three part okay. docu series. It's pretty nuts. The guy was basically, um, he, it's like he, it almost to me. I didn't get to the third part yet, but it feels like a guy who started a church who was a cult leader figured out the algorithm of TikTok and was hiring or not hiring, indoctrinating a bunch of like young, pretty early teens or early 20s kids to do TikTok dances to earn him money and then not pay them any money. So they were getting Uh millions of views on TikTok. And then under the guise of being part of a church, he wasn't giving them the money that they were making from their TikTok accounts. But Uh he was he was telling them what to wear, what music to dance to, all these things. And they were making, they were getting millions in views on TikTok. Cause you know, this is early TikTok, like 2021, where it was like, when I was like, I'm not getting TikTok. This is the lamest thing I've ever seen. You just watch people dance. Yeah. When that's all TikTok was basically. <laughs> yeah, that was. And this you, guy was, was cleaning up. They'd be like, uh, hit the whoa and Dougie. Whoa, hit the yeah, a hey, yeah. And these kids were making a bunch of money and it was going all to this, to, to the church guy. Yeah. So I, I did like that. Um, and I, I'm going to finish that. Other than that, I don't have anything. I did not finish Under the Bridge yet. I will finish it, but I did not finish it yet. Um, so please. I am going to watch. I do something. I have something in my queue, though. I'm going to watch. What is that? I, gotta, I, don't have, I, don't have, I don't have Fox on Hulu, so I, I got to figure out a way to get that. Sure. But um, I wanted to watch. Uh, I think it's called Get Clipped, I think. Oh, never heard of that. It's about. It's about I, I think that's what it's called. But it's about the Clippers. Oh, I started watching that, too. Wow. Did? Good, yeah, How I did. It? It's interesting, bro. A lot of people are making fun of the the casting because yeah, it is hilarious though. But where are you gonna find somebody that looks like Blake Griffin? Blake Griffin is one of the most unique, weird looking guys. He's like an albino, <laughs> b- 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 ginger black dude. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris Paul, I think the guy that's playing Chris Paul is pretty good. I like the his demeanor, and you know these, these are and also like JJ Reddick's like a really handsome guy. Like, yeah, who are you gonna who are you gonna find the and also he's not the star of the show, so it's like he's like eighth on the call sheet. You're not gonna mm-hmm. pay some handsome Hollywood right. guy to be JJ Reddick, and he yeah. barely has any lines. So it's does, like, does, does the show remind you of um, Showtime? Showtime, yeah. Uh, no, because I think they did a really no. good job casting dude that plays Magic Johnson. So there's nobody I would say is. What about the guy that plays Doc Rivers? I don't think you get nobody. Better Lawrence than that. Fishburne. Yeah. 
It's <laughs> fine. It's fi- that's the whole thing. Everybody's to me. Everybody's fine. That's why I don't even want to make fun of. It. I think everybody's fine. I don't think yeah. anybody's great. I don't think anybody's like whoa. He went through a transformation, lost some weight, gained a weight, whatever, and he looks just like this person. Yeah. Other than the girl that's playing V, who was the woman who blew up the whole thing, was this mistress. Yeah. She looks very much like the woman and acts very much like the woman. Okay. And then Al Bundy, uh, can't remember his name right now, is doing a great Donald Sterling. But even he doesn't look, Donald, Donald Sterling looked a little too, little too decrepit and creepy. That's Al Bundy, man. I love him. So he doesn't look creepy. Al Bundy from My Wife and Kids? Yeah, yeah. No, what? From, from what Love and Mar- uh, Married with Children. Married with Children. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Modern okay. Family. I can't, why don't I know his name right now? Al Bundy. He'll always be Al Bundy to me. But, yeah, yeah uh, he's playing Donald Sterling. And he's doing a good job making people uncomfortable. Now, when they show Steph, the guy that they cast, they got to be Steph Curry for, like, two seconds, you're like, all right, this yeah. is crazy. But <laughs> Him and Clay Thompson. Him and Clay Thompson, Draymond Green. You don't really see the guy that plays Draymond Green, but you hear him talking shit, you're like, well, that's Draymond Green. Yeah. So I, you, I, yeah. I've, I've seen, like, little uh, clips of, not clips, but, like, pictures of those people who had, he has. The pictures out of context look crazy. So is it, is it good, though? So I like this. So far, I watched the first two episodes. It is it is it's a straight up and down retelling of what happened. So if you know the story, yeah. then you then it's playing out exactly. Now if you don't know the story, you go, damn, this shit is crazy. He really was. They show they show him like holding Blake Griffin's hand, taking him around the party, being like, "This is my basketball player." Yeah, showing him around. Yeah, it was wild. Yeah. So they show all yeah. that shit, and you go, I, I "This shit is crazy." Yeah. So I I don't know if I have that on Hulu, but I I got I'll figure it out. I have it on Hulu. That's why I watched it. That's where I watched it. So it, no, it, I mean, I th- it's, it's on Hulu. It's not because that's why it says on Fox. Fox on Hulu or something. Oh, shit. I might. I probably. So I might have some pack. pack. Yeah, I might have. Okay. <laughs> I might have some extra pack. It's, it's actually very likely that I have some kind of extra package. So yeah, fair. But um, I I, is it I watched. Get clipped? Say it Got again. Clip. Is it what is it called? Got I don't. Clip? That sounds sure. That sounds right. I just saw the picture of Doc of um Lawrence Fishburne as Doc Rivers. I was like, oh, this is that thing. I, I turned it on. I watched okay. the first two episodes. I thought it was good. Gotcha. So yeah, uh, uh, listen, hey folks, hey. Now, as you can see or or not see, uh, I can watch I, it. Never mind, I got it. Oh, you I can. can oh, he's got it, he, guys. He's got it. Let me turn the music off. Um, I, the video froze, <laughs> so I'm either we're gonna clip this up and put some clips of the video out, or nothing will come out at all and just forget everything we said about a video. But the video froze. We got to get yeah. back to the drawing board and figure out why that happened. But hopefully we can bring you guys some clips of this episode, chop it up in some kind of way, maybe put it on TikTok. Hey, whoa, hey, yeah, hey, uh, oh, hit the whoa. After you, um, after you just bashing it, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, but um, hey, listen, we tried. We're trying to bring you guys some new angles, some different content. We're, we're freshly motivated from Crime Con. Absolutely. This has been another episode of Affirmative Murder. I've been Alvin Williams, joined as always by my partner in true crime, Francel Evans. And we'll see you guys next week. Deuces.